unfortunately, I think I'm going to continue the trend of um, injecting uh, fear into the hearts of anybody listening, because you should be very afraid. Uh, I'll just start off by saying that the world is not a safer place than it was the last time I spoke. In fact, it's um, uh, it, it's even more dangerous. Um, the situation in Ukraine um, continues to manifest itself um, in a manner which puts us on the cusp of um, immediate nuclear war, not something to be looking at the future. One stroke of the pen um, authorizing long-range weapons uh, built by NATO in the United States, targeted by NATO in the United States, uh, to be fired into Russia, um, will generate a Russian response that will lead us to a war between Russia and NATO, which will lead us to a nuclear exchange, which will lead us to a general nuclear war, which will kill us all. Um, I, if you haven't read it, I would just advise everybody to go out and get a copy of uh, Andy Jacobson's book, Nuclear War Scenario. Um, I bought it last Sunday, um, read it twice in the same day, uh, and I'm going to read it again because I need the message just to sink into every cell in my body um, that we are all going to die if there's a nuclear war. And if we don't change the policies that we have in place today, there will be a nuclear war. So your death is inevitable. I'm speaking to dead people. Now, normally that's a normal statement. We all will die. None of us are immortal. Um, but I'm speaking to people who are going to die on natural deaths. Every per person listening here will die an unnatural death if we allow these policies to continue. But it's gotten even more dangerous because um, something that hasn't been heralded in the press um, is the fact that Iran is now a nuclear power. Now, Iran hasn't admitted this in so many words, but statements, consecutive statements made by senior Iranian officials have certified that the fatwa that has been uh, in existence since Ayatollah Khomeini's time um, is subject to reversal under certain circumstances. And one of those circumstances is when the enemy seeks to use a uh, type of weapon against you, you can use that type of weapon against the enemy. Israel has nuclear weapons. Israel is threatening to attack Iran's nuclear weapons facilities. As Helga mentioned, uh, these facilities, many of them are not conducive to conventional strike. So therefore, if you're threatening to strike the facilities to take them out, you're threatening to use weapons capable of accomplishing that mission, which means you're threatening to attack Iran with nuclear weapons. That is a statement of fact. It's not up for debate. Um, it's just a ask Donald Trump why he changed the American uh, nuclear employment uh, posture when he was president. Um, and the reason why is he had to incorporate two new categories of nuclear weapons that were capable of destroying Iran's nuclear facilities. Uh, one is a, uh, a, a, ver a variant of the B-61 bomb, which is a gravity bomb dropped by certain American aircraft, including the B-2 bomber. This uh, B-61 variant was adapted to be a bunker buster, to have penetration capability, um, specifically designed to destroy Iran's underground nuclear facilities. Uh, we built the weapon, we deployed the weapon, and we have plans to use the weapon. So when you hear Donald Trump, the candidate, say uh, Israel should hit Iran's nuclear sites, what he's saying is Israel should nuke Iran's nuclear sites because the only way you can hit Iran's nuclear sites is to use a nuclear weapon. And he can't claim ignorance on the matter because he personally signed off on the adaptation of America's nuclear employment plan to incorporate weapons that were are nuclear in nature because they're the only weapons to take out the facility. So he is encouraging Israel to nu uh, launch a nuclear strike against Iran. Uh, last May, former foreign minister of Iran currently a, a senior member of the Expediency Discernment Council, a senior decision-making body within the Iranian governmental structures mandated by const, the con Iranian constitution to provide advice to the Supreme Leader, said in, in that basically Iran, even though this fatwa exists, the fatwa is reversible, and under certain circumstances, Iran could consider pursuing a nuclear weapon. This was echoed by a senior officer in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, command this past summer, who said 
that if Israel attacks Iran with a nuclear weapon, Iran will develop a nuclear weapons capability. The Iranian parliament has debated the issue and has sent a recommendation to the supreme leader to withdraw from the non-proliferation treaty uh, and to begin building nuclear bombs. And the Iranians, again, have come out uh, and said that uh, if Israel threatens them, threatens them with nuclear attack, Iran will build a nuclear weapon. Israel has threatened Iran with a nuclear attack. Um, declaratory policy of this nature isn't made in a vacuum, meaning that uh, uh, people who operate at the level of the people that I'm t talking about who are um, citing fatwas issued by the Supreme Leader don't make these, ca these comments casually. In fact, none of them could make that comment unless it was cleared with the Supreme Leader. And the Supreme Leader isn't in the business of putting contradictory information out there. What is taking place is Iran's version of declaratory policy. Iran is putting the world on notice that it has nuclear weapons capability. Uh, and that if, Iran, if Israel attacks them, Iran will use this nuclear capability in retaliation against Israel. Three or five Iranian nuclear weapons targeted against Israel will destroy Israel forever. Um, and we don't know where it goes from that. We are very close to a nuclear war in the Middle East. Uh, very close. Where will it take us? I don't know. Uh, Vladimir Putin just met with uh, the new Iranian president uh, in Turkmenistan. Uh, Russia has been talking about and, and entering into uh, you know, security agreements with, uh, with Iran. Um, Iran is now a member of the BRICS community. Um, I would imagine that um, they are talking about what happens if Israel launches a nuclear attack against Iran. What will Russia's response be? Given the uh, cordial relationship, the shake of the hands, the smiles, it wasn't a conversation that was a difficult conversation for either of them, which implies that Russia has given Iran certain assurances. Um, that means that if Israel attacks Iran, Russia will have Iran's back as they respond nuclearly against Israel. What would the United States do in that instance? Now we see a situation where the scenario is spinning out of control, moving away from a regional nuclear conflict to the potential of a global nuclear conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, we've never been closer to nuclear demise than we are today. Now we have it from two fronts. And the United States has, has been on record since the time of Barack Obama, that if Iran develops a nuclear weapons capability, the United States will respond militarily. Iran has developed a nuclear weapons capability. What will the United States do? Donald Trump says that that will never happen. It has happened, and he's one of the main reasons why it has happened, because he withdrew from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which was a treaty-like vehicle that put certain restrictions on Iran's program, allowed weapons inspectors to be in Iran, monitoring this program to ensure that Iran didn't convert a, a, a civilian project into a military project. But because we withdrew, the Europeans were never um, assiduous in their implementation. Iran was able to back away, legally so, uh, from its commitments under the JCPOA to the point today where there is no JCPOA. And Iran is enriching uranium without restriction. They, they've enriched up to 60%. This is enough to just that can be justified because they use that 60% to produce fuel plates uh, that are used in a research reactor, but it's far greater. The amount is far greater than necessary to produce fuel. Uh, what that means is that Iran uh, will be able to take the 60% uh, enriched uranium hexafluoride, use as a feedstock in advanced centrifuge cascades that are already in place in the underground facilities to rapidly uh, convert 60% into 96 to 98%. This can happen in a matter of days. Or, uh, as I said, Iran already has the ability to convert this uh, enriched uranium hexafluoride into metal. They produce metal plates for uh, their, their existing Tehran uh, research reactor. Uh, they could produce the uranium metal in quantities sufficient to generate, uh, to create critical mass and generate fission. Um, this is all that's necessary for a gun type device. Iran doesn't need a sophisticated testing mechanism. Indeed, the United States built two bombs that were used against uh, Japan during World War II. One was um, the fat man, the other was a little boy. Fat man was the, the version that was tested at Almogordo on July 16th, 1945. It was a plutonium-based weapon that used a sophisticated implosion um, apparatus. It had to be tested because it was all theoretical. The uranium gun design didn't have to be tested because it's very simple. 
It's not sophisticated. If you have sufficient enriched, highly enriched uranium, you can build a gun design that will generate 15 to 20 kiloton charge. This is what I believe the Iranians will build. It's easily deployed on, a, uh, on missiles that Iran has. Iran has shown that its missiles can strike Israel without fear of interception. And uh, Iran will be able to launch missiles equipped with nuclear warheads against Israel. And there's nothing Israel or the United States can do to prevent that. This is a whole new paradigm right now that challenges all red lines across the board. Um, how will the United States respond? Well, so far, we've avoided saying that we will participate in an Israeli attack against uh, Iran because we understand the escalatory nature of this. But if Iran's declaratory policy appears to point to the existence of a nuclear weapons program, will the United States now say we will help Israel? All that does is guarantee Israel's elimination as a modern nation state, and it also puts tens of thousands of American troops at risk, which means that if Iran threatens American troops, according to our nuclear doctrine, this would create a sufficient justification for the United States to preemptively use nuclear weapons against Iran. If we use nuclear weapons against Iran, um, we could inadvertently or deliberately provoke a Russian response. And now we're all dead. Do you see how this works? This is the world we live in. Um, it's a world we may not be living in much longer. Um, this vote coming up in on 5th November matters. But it only matters if we can get the candidates to commit to policies to talk about walking away from nuclear weapons instead of doubling down on stupid, promoting existing policies that are leading us towards nuclear war. Um, so it requires everybody to uh, get up and vocalize. Uh, I know that uh, Diane Sayre is holding an event in uh, New York City on uh, October 26th. Uh, the next day, there will be a brunch in New York City where we will have panels that will be discussing this. Um, uh, we'll be advertising that, but I would encourage everybody to attend the event in New York City on the 26th and then... Uh, attend the uh, brunch on the 27th, empower yourself with knowledge and information, and then go out there and vote accordingly. Hold people accountable pr prior to the election and hold whoever wins accountable after the election. If we fail to do so, uh, human nature being what it is, we will probably end up in a nuclear conflict before the year is out, and none of this conversation matters. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you, Scott. just want to underline something that you had said about all these different candidates doubling down with stupid. I think it's important that everybody on this meeting not think about this election as a football game, which unfortunately it's how most people think about this stuff. Who do you like whom and you know all this kind of nonsense. Every candidate should be gone after to stop nuclear war, all of them. We shouldn't be playing games around who do we like more or whatever, this is not, this is too too risky of, of a situation to just let people run off, run their mouths the way they've been doing. So thank you for saying that. I, I know uh, Helga Zepp LaRouche, uh, she had a she wanted to give a response. Uh, please go ahead, Helga. Well, Scott, you succeeded to scare me to death. Um, I mean, we are trying to keep up with the developing intelligence, uh, especially naturally before such a meeting. And, you know, I was aware of the fact that that possibility existed, but I was not aware that Iran did have uh, succeeded in developing this capability, which if, if what you say is the case, indeed, we are on total red alert. Is there any way how that can be, you know, put in front of the world public, like, for example, approaching the UN Security Council to hold a special session because I think, you know, we can warn the world, but um, I think if, if if it is at that point, I think it would require some institution like the UN Security Council to alarm the world. W what do you say? Uh, first of all, Iran will never, first of all, Iran has not formally declared the existence of a nuclear weapon. Iran's uh, nuclear material continues to be under safeguard and um, uh, safeguard uh, in, uh, you know, inspections by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, what I'm saying is that Iran, by making declaratory statements of this nature, um, their ability to turn these statements from theory to reality is near instantaneous. It's not a large technological leap to have a nuclear device minus the fissile material ready to launch. And I believe Iran has this. Every indication through their statements implies that they are ready to respond immediately. 
Um, Iran would, uh, before they could have, actually have a declared nuclear capability, uh, Iran would probably have to uh, withdraw from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. That's something that the uh, Iranian parliament is urging the Supreme Leader to do right now. Um, once they um, make that announcement, then Iran can shut down the monitoring. The, the monitoring, the IAE monitoring, no longer has legal viability, and Iran can begin the immediate diversion of the highly enriched or the low enriched 60% uh, in uranium to the uranium cascades and literally within a matter of a day or two would have enough um, fissile uh, material to convert to metal and then put into a warhead. So in less than a week, Iran can go from a policy decision to a, um, a usable weapon. And if you give them two weeks, they'll have three to five usable weapons. Uh, that's where we're at right now. But the Security Council can't take action on a theory because the IEAA would be called in and say there is no diversion of material. Um, and it also raised the question of, um, you know, what is prompting this threat? And the answer is Israel. And the last thing the United States wants is Israel's nuclear weapons capability discussed in the Security Council. Um, and so that's the problem we have in Israel that uh, has this um, ambiguity Result, re revolving around its nuclear weapons capability. Everybody knows they have them. Everybody knows they're there, but nobody talks about it. Um, and the danger of this weapons capability has become manifest because previously it was talked about as only the Samson option. That is, if Israel's being overrun, Israel will use these weapons to take everybody down with Israel. But now we have a situation where Israel is literally talking about um, a, 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 a strike against uh, Iran's um, nuclear capabilities uh, that is, doesn't involve Israel being overrun. It's a reaction to um, a problem that Israel created by assassinating um, you know, a, a senior Hamas official in Tehran on the day the Iranian president was inaugurated, on assassinating Hassan Nasrallah, on attacking uh, the, uh, is, uh, the Iranian consulate in Damascus. Um, this is a problem of Israel's own making, and now it's manifested itself in a manner in which Israel is threatening to attack Iran in a manner that can only be accomplished with nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons that Israel has yet to declare officially having. Um, and, and this is the real problem here. To solve this problem, um, we have to not only talk about uh, walking away from whatever could trigger the potential use of nuclear we uh, weapons by Israel, but we have to address the destabilizing reality of Israel's nuclear weapons because those nuclear weapons now manifested themselves in a cause-effect relationship with Iran, which is going to prompt Iran to withdraw from the NPT and and, uh, and produce its own nuclear weapons. And if Iran withdraws from the NPT, Saudi Arabia has indicated they will be seeking their own individual independent nuclear deterrent. Turkey has said the same thing. And now we have a region totally out of control, making the possibility of nuclear war um, even more likely. So, you know, we, we need to start talking about disarmament. We need to start talking about uh, breathing life back into the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, but the JCPOA cannot be called the Iran nuclear deal anymore. The JCPOA, in order to be viable, has to involve Iran and Israel uh, agreeing to, um, <clears throat> you know, reciprocal inspection regimes that lead to guarantee that neither nation has a nuclear weapons capability. Israel's nuclear weapons cannot be allowed to exist. They are an existential threat uh, to the world, to the region, and to Israel. Uh, because if Israel uses nuclear weapons against Iran, Israel will cease to exist. That is a 100% guaranteed outcome that will happen. Um, even if they don't strike nuclear sites, if they just limit their strikes to oil facilities or anything else, Iran has said they will fire over a thousand uh, conventional missiles into the critical infrastructure targets of Israel. This means they'll destroy all of the power plants, all of the uh, water purification plants, all of the power distribution plants, all of uh, energy production, oil and gas, critical infrastructure, um, and Israel will be thrown into the Stone Age. And if Iran does that kind of attack, then the Samson option kicks in and Israel will retaliate with nuclear weapons, which will lead to Iran developing nuclear weapons and deploying them against Israel in a very short period of time. We are in an extremely dangerous situation, and it's not made any easier knowing that Benjamin Netanyahu and Joe Biden had a vir virtual shouting match. When you talked about a shouting match, I thought you were going to talk about the phone call that Biden had with uh, with Netanyahu, 
where Biden basically told Netanyahu he has to stand down on this irresponsible posture vis-a-vis -vis Iran, and Netanyahu told him to pound sand. And so now you see, for instance, people are asking, why did uh, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations come out and suddenly articulate in favor of two United Nations resolutions regarding uh, Palestine? One, um, a ceasefire, the other one, the uh, immediate... Um, um, dispatch of humanitarian goods. These are two resolutions the United States has opposed in the past. And uh, the, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations has articulated forcefully against these. But now she's advocating for them. Why? Because Biden promised Netanyahu that if he walks away from uh, attacking Iran, that the United States would provide not only unprecedented levels of military support, um, but also we would have Israel's back diplomatically. Israel will never fear uh, anything from the United Nations. Netanyahu has disregarded Biden's advice, and so now Biden is making Netanyahu pay a price. And um, this, you know, I don't think is going to succeed in um, doing anything other than pushing the Israelis even closer to making the decision to attack Iran. Um, we are in a, a, a very dangerous situation because the United States appears to have lost the ability to pressure Israel into uh, taking... Um, uh, actions that um, are, are are good for the United States. Uh, and if Israel is not taking any guidance, that means that this comes down to not what's good for Israel, what's good for Benjamin Netanyahu, and he's willing to sacrifice all of the people of Israel, hundred or over 100 million people in the region, because he wants to go down in history with a legacy as a strong man um, who saved Israel. But he's going to be the man who destroyed Israel and took the region down with him.